New Guinea has worn me down. I hate it. In our first visit, we managed to catch malaria, typhoid fever, and toxemia. In encounters with natives, we had to fight for our bare lives. Goodbye, Guinea. Never again. Traveling is my drug. Once you get to know the variety of touches, experiences, and sense of our world, you can't live without it anymore. I'm in it up to my neck. My favorite phrase is that an experience doesn't have to be positive, especially when it's intense. I'm attracted by all of the different flavors of our planet, from the tropics to the poles. But the seasoning of the world is in its people, in their traditions and styles of life in their natural environment. This hunger for knowledge is the drive behind my journeys. Everyone who travels a little knows that what I can see and feel today may no longer be here in a few years' time. Western civilization expands frighteningly fast. We have to hurry. America won't escape. Unbeatable experiences replace the misery of the journeys. In addition, New Guinea itself is a really powerful drug. I'm absorbing the unpleasant moments from the past and returning to this hot land. It took a week to arrange all of the special permits, which open the inaccessible areas to us. Before leaving, I'm often asked if I'm not scared of cannibals. Of course I'm scared, especially of places that I thought no longer existed. missionaries with their churches arrived in the land of the headhunters several decades ago. Generally, they tried to suppress the traditions of the Asmat people and replace them with new civilization, which brought along alcohol, gambling, and money. We hire an awfully expensive boat, and using the flood tide, we proceed as far as 100 kilometers up the river to the interior of the island. The territory that we're aiming for is unknown. We can't learn much from the natives either. Paradoxically, the missionaries tell them more about America than about the tribes and customs of their own land. I feel great respect, respect for such wild nature and the natives. After a few days of sailing, we enter into the last bastion of civilization, Amas village. Progress here is also promoted by a missionary. For visiting the local church, the natives are rewarded with shorts and t-shirts. We are considered to be intruders. Allegedly, we can't go any further. We have the important permits containing all of those powerful stamps. Nothing can discourage us. At sunrise, we set out into this green world together with a group of natives. We hope to get beyond the mysterious pacification line, an imaginary border past which the natives live up trees. No roads lead through this humid and boggy jungle. If we were to find one, all of the mysteries would vanish. Barefooted natives confidently cross over the balance beams of the jungle. I'm afraid when walking in boots, a broken bone could have very unpleasant consequences. 
after our cameraman Palo injures his knee after falling, we stretch a rope over the really precarious places. I can't really imagine transporting an injured person in these conditions. The eyes of the jungle watch us. A native with a hornbill beak on his penis is aiming at us. Fortunately, he recognizes one of our quarters. The tension releases with our tobacco, which also repels the intrusive insects. Kuriare, as our native is called, is hunting with his son. I walk together with him into the village. The others wait for me at the edge of it. We need the permission of the leader of the tribe to be able to enter. From here, our porters return home. I say goodbye to Bovas, who's done so much for us. He warns us to be careful of the tree people. Different principles, manners and rules of behavior apply in their land. They're supposed to be very vicious, not letting anyone step into their territory. Excited to observe local customs, we decide to stay longer in the village. In Guinea, the value of a woman is counted in pigs. The parents of the best women can even ask for five pigs from a potential son-in-law. The dog is another domestic animal. It also serves as a walking towel after a meal. The Kombai understand human conception rather bizarrely. They believe that a man doesn't fertilize a woman. He merely opens her for a spirit from the jungle to enter and plant an embryo of a future descendant. According to the Kombai, sexual intercourse has nothing to do with human birth at all. In the morning, Kuriare's older son suffered with stomach pains. His father tried to chase the negative energy from all of the boy's bodily orifices. This treatment took a few hours, and we were worried whether the boy would survive it. We thought of whether to give him some medicine, but this could have been a double-edged weapon. If he were to accidentally die, they could consider us to be wizards who arranged for the boy's death. But they could also link his death with our arrival. <laughs> The village elders talked for a long time. Finally, they agreed. We were able to cross their swamps to reach the lands of the tree people. They even promised us an escort. Kind Waburare led us through the labyrinth of swamps. Only he was able to see the open paths of the jungle. When traveling, one can find real friends to truly trust. I got very close to Palop and Yirko during moments that tested us all really very well. For example, by the river Sepik, where mad natives almost did away with me. Waburare warns us that we're entering the area of the arboreal combine, about which very little is known. Mosquitoes have turned this plain into the worst area in the world for malaria. This is why the natives build their huts so high in the treetops.
Říkali jsme na kraji paseky, až se vrátí bapa nebo náčelník We waited until the arrival of the tribal leader. He ran out with a bow, an arrow on the string, yelling frightfully. I was still smiling like a fool while he aimed at me. It seemed to take awfully long. I was afraid that he would lose his temper. The bow was drawn and the arrow could have been loosed at any second. He was probably as afraid of the color of my skin as I was of his reactions. In the end, the leader of the tribe was glad that our large expedition had come in peace. But he still held back a bit. In the end, everything turned out well. We were allowed to stay in one of their tree huts, out of reach of the nasty insects. It's interesting how the Kombai managed to hang their huts in the tops of trees without any ropes or nails. Palo cheers us up with his story about an anthropologist who killed himself by falling off the pole of a tree hut. I hope I don't end the same way. The pole is shaking and leaning over. My 85 kilograms is probably above the limit of its normal load capacity. I don't know how I'm going to get down again. I enter the world of the tree people, a sort of a house in the clouds. I admire the courage and ability of the women. They're able to carry up a pig in a net, as well as a hunting dog. The leader of the tribe shows us magic with a rattan rope. We witness the birth of fire. A layer of river clay on the floor prevents the hut becoming one huge torch. The smallest child is tied to a wooden post by a rope. In this way, it's secure against falling out of the nest. The leader of the tribe has two wives. They've had 12 children, nine of whom died. Was it malaria or a fall from height that killed them? Who knows? The leader tries our tobacco. As a non-smoker, I feel my head spinning after a few pulls and amusing the others, I begin to cough. A woman grills lumps of sago. It doesn't look very appetizing, so we rather cook our instant soup for dinner. In the evening, Yirko treats my inflamed wounds. Terrific thirst increases the suffering. I also need to empty my bladder, but I'm afraid of climbing down that damp pole into the mysterious world of spells, spirits and magic. The tribal leader, Bapa, has caught a large lizard for our breakfast. He offers us its still warm heart as a delicacy. Women bring green bananas from the jungle for roasting. 
The children also look for food somewhere in the swamps. A while later, the proud young hunters return, showing us their respectable catch, a wading bird shot with an arrow by the smallest one of them. The porters are given the bird. It's amazing how they manage to cut any kind of meat into portions with a bamboo knife in a few seconds. No large mammals live in Guinea, but that's no reason for their cuisine to be any poorer. The bird kingdom is well represented. Until now, 860 bird species have been discovered in this area. The beautiful paradise bird stands out the most. We struggle through the green labyrinth of the widest virgin jungle on our planet. The native tribal leaders are grumpy, muttering something about the old prophecies, which tell about spirits with faces as white as dead fish, coming to their land and turning the jungle inside out, like the skin of a paradise bird. People in another village also take us as bad spirits. A man's duty is to protect the women and children hidden in the treetops. An arrow flies past my head as a warning. The man relaxes noticeably after we assure him that we come in peace. His name is Khani Palma. The height the hut is built at shows their fear of strangers to be greater than their fear of nature. We've caused a stir in the tree village. One of our porters made a ball for the scared children. The parents frightened their small children. If you're naughty, a demon in the shape of an ugly white man will come for you from the jungle. A bad white ghost. It seems we're the first strangers that these natives have ever seen. From now on, they'll evaluate the entire unknown world according to us. We try to break down the barrier of fear with cubes of fruit sugar. As they don't know what sugar is, they're skeptical. Khani Panama again shows the greatest courage. Refusing an offer of food would be impolite. Sago damper is the most delightful meal for the natives. For our taste buds spoiled by a variety of chemical flavorings, it reminds one of polystyrene. But with a bit of garlic and some spicy sausage, it tastes excellent. These inhabitants of the Stone Age survive with simple tools. The stone axe is certainly the most important of them. They simply could not build their houses without it. Just now, Kani Panama is making a new axe for clearing the jungle. Iron is not yet known in this region. An iron axe could cut down a tree much faster. But why? Nobody is in a hurry here. The natives have plenty of time. The oldest daughter carries water up to the hut in bamboo tubes. It's intended for drinking. The natives don't cook as they don't have any dishes for it. A clay pot is a strange thing to them. Instead, they use bamboo, even though it has its weaknesses. None of them know their date of birth. They split time into days and days into two halves. From sunrise to sunset, 
which is designed for living, and the other half, which is black, being the time of spirits and magic. Today, our kettle will cook a ceremonial feast from the gifts of the jungle and our backpacks for everybody in the hut. After dinner, I gorge myself fully on the arboreal life in huge gulps. It seems to me like I'm on a totally different planet. Life in a tree is simple, but still so complicated. Knowledge is only passed on verbally. Khani Parliament names the cardinal numbers for us. Each squat finger is counted. A closed fist means five. A finger on the wrist means six. On the forearm, it means seven. On the elbow, eight. His daughter is the one most confused by this manual math. I try to grasp how these people perceive the surrounding world. The natives revealed to us that the jungle is full of spirits. They mostly live in burned out trees, but also in plants that can cause death. Don't look in the trees in the morning. If you find a snake there, you can expect something bad to happen to you. Never lean your face over water. Spirits from whirlpools and currents, white water, can cause sickness. That's how Kani Parama's father is supposed to have died. <laughs> I'm at the Kombai barber. Yirko and Palo laugh at my courage. My head is in the hands of a head hunter. <laughs> the rain has stopped. We want to continue our journey, but Waparare and the porters don't really rush ahead into another adventure. Nobody is supposed to live there. There's only a hidden world. But that's exactly what we want. Eventually, our group expands by two girls. Kani Panama's two daughters will help us look for the path through the swamps. They will carry the arrows that we got as a gift from the Azmat, as well as the precious pots, like a relay baton. These people haven't invented the wheel yet. What would they need it for anyway? The jungle doesn't know a faster way of travel than walking. We look for a path through the swamps. In the jungle, the length of a route is not measured in kilometers, but by the days and nights spent on the way. Oh. Every day, hour and minute are special here, as if they were the last. We look for the way through, repeatedly looping around. Nobody knows which direction to go. getting dark. The porters are scared of the jungle. They're the only ones here who really know what to be afraid of. Any delay caused by cutting through the jungle is hell for us. The insects make wild revelry on our sweaty, salty bodies. I guess all of the mosquitoes from far away were invited to this feast. Slimy leeches suck the energy from our scratched calves. Sleeping here is simply not possible. In the dark jungle, 
The natives are much faster than us. We lose them and remain on our own. In the end, we found two tree huts, empty. Our guides feel insecure. The native's absence doesn't signify anything good. It was raining all night, but we stayed dry up here. Conflicts between tribes have changed this area into a no-man's land. The jungle of magic, guilt and revenge is sometimes more invincible than the real rough jungle itself. In places where our short natives can pass without difficulty, I have to go on my knees. I swear at the vines that catch us by our heads, legs and backpack, not wanting to let us go on. Thorny leaves prick us painfully. Trickles of blood flow from our fingers. The daylight slowly flickers out. We really need to rest. A lodge appears from afar, as if on legs. It seems to be empty too. We're in an area where any misstep, weakness or half-baked reaction could mean death. The problem occurred because we entered their territory. We didn't ask for permission and came into their hut. They claimed that we're the first strangers on their territory and, moreover, without permission. Their bows were fully drawn. The air was full of emotion. Tobacco, so much condemned by our civilization, helps to pacify the indignant warriors. We smoke a pipe together. There are times when you just have to. The pictures from my expeditions to the native tribes of New Guinea also help to break down the barrier of fear. About 270 indigenous peoples live in Guinea. Individual tribes have lived in fear of mutual attacks for centuries. Because of their isolation, they speak about 700 languages on the island. They haven't the faintest idea who else lives in New Guinea, apart from themselves. People who live in the dense treetops have no idea that our planet is round. They believe that the great spirit Ginol, who lives high above the clouds together with the other spirits, created the earth and everything on it. Ginol divided the world into several levels. Similar worlds, inhabited by people, exist below as well as above them. After death, the dead can travel from one world to another. A rat's tooth carves decorations on the weapons of these Stone Age warriors. Only a few trifles accompany them throughout their lives. A bow, arrows, tobacco pipe, rat and rope for fire, and sago in a net made from orchid fibre. Their only clothing is a green leaf. It's tied at the end of their private parts 
as if the penis is missing. It's somewhere inside. It's not really clear where, but it's certainly there. Hi, brother. People in this area suffer from a strange disease. Small grubs spiral their way under the skin. The dead layers flake off. Anthropologists reckon that arrows kill about 5% of the population here. Each warrior's quiver contains 10 arrows. Each arrow has its own name and is used for different purposes. The biggest and most dangerous is the one for killing people. On its point, the arrow is cut with slots and fitted with thorns, so it can't be pulled out. Feathers aren't used in this region. One of the warriors tries to prove that he doesn't need them anyway. We offer a soup packet as a target. In admiration, I shake his hand. He's so pleased that he would happily shake my hand until the evening. The girls have to return home. A native called Valigare will take us across his own land. In return, he tried to get Paolo's shorts without success. In the end, he took over the relay with the Asmat arrows. The natives are mostly afraid of snakes, which are supposed to conceal bad spirits within themselves. From 110 species, adders and taipans are the most poisonous. The neurotoxic and paralytic venom of the adder affects the nervous system. Taipan venom is hemotoxic and destroys blood cells, but the effect is always the same. The natives put their trophies into our teapot. They don't understand why it annoys us. We discovered another hut. I try to win over the owner with the well-tried sugar. His tongue loosens when he's given the captured snake. His wife brings pandanus and flame red boamera, which is full of tasty red seeds. Valigari removes the fibrous core with a bone knife. We try to guess what it could be made from. There aren't that many possibilities. We find out that it's the thigh bone of a cassowary, the largest bird in New Guinea. The landlord puts stones on the fire to heat and helps Valigara. The hard fruits of the Boamera are laid on banana leaves and the red hot stones are put inside them. Finally, everything is wrapped up and allowed to steam until the fruits soften. In the meantime, the snake is ready. Everybody gets a piece, the residents, porters and guests. Unfortunately, the snake is so long that some of this delicacy is also left for us. A mystical power is attributed to snake meat, but otherwise it's dry and too stringy. I had to chew it for a long time. Fortunately, snakes here are not sacred as they are in other parts of Guinea. Here, they won't kill us because of a snake. 
The Buamera fruit remains cooking in its natural steamer for several hours. As late as in the night, the natives squeeze out a red sauce for their sago damper. The red Buamera is evocative of a bloody feast. I hope that it's not going to be one. In the morning, we disappear into the infinite swamps. In the past, I read a report from a missionary in Yanirume. It claimed that headhunters still exist in this area. They're supposed to kill and eat anyone who causes someone's death. This cannibalism occurred a few years ago, when tribal combat broke out again. The winners ate more than 20 people. Poor Waburare tries to break the atmosphere of distrust and the doubts of the natives, who are surprised to meet people, especially white people. Our porters also feel insecure. They give one child a toy from the teapot. Eating termites reminds me of the case of one native who, together with his three friends, was offered a meal in a tree hut. By refusing, they signed their own death warrants. His friends were killed during the night. He only saved his life by jumping out of the high tree hut. The moral of this story which we must adopt, is if you don't want to be eaten, eat what you're offered. All of their lives revolve around food. Their bowels have come to be the place of feeling and thought. I bet on my bowels basically means I think. Something like natural death doesn't really exist in their understanding. Even after his death, a dead person is able to identify who caused his death. It could be a member of his clan or even his close family. The guilty person so identified must be found and killed. His body must be eaten so that the evil is destroyed. Every murder causes a vendetta, a whole chain of violence, conflicts and killing. There's no room for complicated bargaining. Meat wrapped in banana leaves is stewed on red hot stones and, of course, is eaten with sago. One of the natives points out the headband, which I have to put on for the feast. Later, I realize what it's made of. It's the tail of the rat that's being cooked in the fire right now. I must look very handsome with this rat on my head. When the damper with the rat is cooked, Every man gets a piece of this Kombai speciality. <laughs> Despite my reluctance, I get my portion too. Surprisingly, it tastes like rabbit. The Kombai have nothing made from leather because they eat animals with the skin on. It's interesting that the men and women prepare their food separately. A meal prepared by a woman can deprive a man of his fighting strength and make him weak. Children are named as late as at 18 months old. Any earlier would have no sense, as many of them don't survive infancy. A name is gained when it's taken from someone else, together with his life. Only people who are known by their name are considered potential victims.
The hunters showed us their most precious trophies, the skulls of animals, birds and various rodents, the skulls of enemies too. All of them have a great hole in the vertex. That's where the brain was taken out, a valued delicacy, not a single piece of which may be thrown away. The porters have already become our friends. They're not even cross anymore if we refuse one of their dishes. For safety's sake, Valigara signals that we're approaching a village. After all, we are in the land of the headhunters. There's heavy rain every night. We can't sleep properly in the swamps and in tents full of mosquitoes. We should arrange with this tribe to spend a night in the dry again. Surviving in a different world is not easy. Miraculously, a bag of tobacco helps us again. I will never smoke again after this expedition. The next day, the warriors go to collect their favorite sago worms. Rhinoceros beetles lay their eggs in old sago palm trunks, under the bark, as well as in deep cracks. The fat grubs are collected a month later. These grubs form the basis of any ceremonial feast, served with the brains of dead enemies. It's supposed to be a fantastic delicacy. I hope they won't serve brains today. The natives like the grubs the most when they're steamed in banana leaves, but they don't refuse raw ones either. If New Guinea didn't exist, I'd have to make it up. I wouldn't have guessed that even a redoubtable cannibal could have a tender heart. I have such fits of happiness when I feel like screaming. Women are coming back from collecting the fruits of the jungle. The young girls take care of the bananas. The girls are already growing breasts, which means that they're ready for marriage. At this age, girls in our country are still below the legal age of consent. These girls get married even before their first period. A bridegroom doesn't choose a beautiful woman, but a strong one, who is able to take care of pigs and children. Breasts are always uncovered, their buttocks never. 
they believe that a spirit can enter them through their anus, so they protect it with a skirt made from orchid fibre. Sex is one of the greatest mysteries of Guinea. Men don't sleep with the women, and they live in separate huts. Sitting by the fire, they explain their separated way of life. So we learn that apart from common food, the close presence of women also weakens them. Men can't spend too much time with women, as women draw energy from them. They basically suck it out of them. Women are supposed to cause them to age. On the other hand, they get younger from them. They know this really well and try to make use of it. With women, one has to be careful. In the morning, we are woken by the odd clapping sound of bark being stripped from the sago palms. It's used as a natural strainer when preparing sago. The sago palm can be used for anything. It's the tree of life for the natives, thanks to which they've survived in these rough swamps for thousands of years. The bark makes good flooring. The leaves are used for the walls and to cover the roofs of their dwellings. Its thorns are used to make popular jewellery, which is fixed to their nostrils. The soaked pulp is the most precious sago product, being the oldest source of food for the tribes of New Guinea. The entire village takes part in preparing sago. Everyone has their own role and knows exactly what to do. The men's duty is to remove the thick, hard palm bark to uncover the inside. In the meantime, the women prepare wooden axes for crushing the pulp. The men's work finishes with freeing the core of the palm trunk. They can look for food in the surrounding jungle again. Crushing the pulp into small pieces in the hot and steaming climate of the jungle is really hard work, and it remains with the women. All their lives, they're used to carrying heavy loads in nets, from children to pigs, and to collecting wood and edible plants in the jungle. Women have only their tears which are saved for lonely childbirths and funerals. The Kombai don't show their feelings. I've not once anywhere seen a couple that would whisper endearments to each other. Tenderness doesn't exist. Love here is well earned. Sago is extremely important for them. They differentiate its quality with 11 different words. But love, sorrow and compassion they know as a single word. We worry ourselves with uncertain futures, but the present hasn't even started here. We send spaceships to look for life on Mars, but we don't know about all of the people living on the Earth. Archaeologists burrow in old excavations and evaluate the relics of our Stone Age ancestors, even though that age has not yet truly ended. Self-existence and independence from material things strongly contrasts with our material world. It's enough to go to the jungle and get everything they need to survive. 
They don't know most of the things in our world. Heart attacks are one of them. I can't say why, but my eyes are getting watery. This moment has a very strong atmosphere for me. The natural factory for Sago production slowly reveals its product. The starch that has settled in the bottom of the pot forms a food, thanks to which hundreds of generations have managed to survive on this island. These people haven't the faintest idea that some place called Indonesia exists, or that they became part of it. Indonesia knows nothing about them. They don't even want to be discovered, trying to delay their destiny as long as possible. Towards the end, they make holes in the trunk of a sago palm that remains. The rhinoceros beetles will lay eggs in them again. In a month's time, the natives will come for the grubs, as if going to a larder. It's difficult to say who is barbarian or what is cruel. Civilization has taught us pretense, sentences of hollow words, empty and filmy statements and verbal crutches. Here, everything is short and direct. If you're good, be a friend. If you're an evildoer, your sentence is instant. Two arrows suddenly fly through the air and fall close to us. We know the shooter. A tribesman from the previous village is attacking us. I can't grasp what's going on. Something has happened in the adjacent village. There's a million questions swirling in my head. But not all of them can be answered. A helicopter with missionaries discovers the tree people one day. A DVD shows a film describing the coming of Jesus. It's a crushing, stunning experience for the natives. In their world of spirits, they see a miracle with their own eyes. They hear that nakedness is a sin. According to the criteria of the religious world, they are the most backward human beings. Their natural gods are banned. The flame in the eyes of these barbaric jungle people flickers out. Knowing can hurt sometimes. In the end, we defend against the truth that we've looked for, for so long. Sometimes, it's better not to understand. We're leaving the rough jungle, which protects the ancient world of the Gombai. A world they won't exchange. A world which is so good. Good. Purarambo, as they say. Purarambo. 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 Rambo. 
Ringgit dalu malu buru rambo. This story is about our journey across the swamps of New Guinea. After our guide found out about our destination, he simply disappeared, left our gear in the hotel, and we had to get to this closed area on our own. Our destination was a primeval region totally untouched by white men. We wanted to find the tree people who haven't the faintest idea about our civilization or its technology, people who live only from what nature gives them. 